First they came for your axes, then they took from Harmony. Now, after Nomad, they've stolen nearly two billion dollars. Coming soon, the 2022 crypto movie of the year, The Hackening. The Hackening? Is that the best we've got? But you did say M. Night Shyamalan was available. We'll call the title a work in progress, okay? The concept though, you have to agree, is pretty good. I know it seems far-fetched, but believe it or not, it is a true story. Two billion dollars just this year, and all from crypto bridges. So what's up? What's happening with these bridges? What's happening with these hackers? Why are they suddenly attacking everything? But we're also gonna go deeper, get some analysis on what everything uh, is doing to crypto prices. The bad news is, it's gonna get worse. Join thousands of NFT traders who already start their day on Crypto Slam. So let's talk again about the Nomad hack. Something like $200 million nicked from the crypto bridge and taken not by one hacker, not even a group of hackers, but supposedly by 300 different accounts. Now technically that was not a hack, it was actually what's called an exploit, but either way, it takes the total number of bridge breaches this year to 13 adding up to a total of $2 billion. That is according to a report by blockchain data platform Chainalysis. Nomads wasn't the biggest, it was double the $100 million that was stolen in an attack on Harmony Bridge earlier in the year. The biggest sum remains the $600 million lost from the Ronin Bridge used by Axie Infinity. You might remember that one. That is considered to be the biggest crypto hack of all time. So. What's being done about this? Can we even believe that our hard-earned crypto is ever gonna be safe ever again on these bridges or indeed anywhere else for that matter? Let's bring in Aaron Plant, who's Senior Director of Investigations at Chainalysis, hopefully gonna give us some answers. Aaron, thanks for talking to us. So why are cross-chain bridges proving to be such an attractive target for hackers? They're proving to be an attractive target for hackers because they're, they're a, a single point where funds move together and they have to be backed by other assets. So they're essentially a single storage point. So if you're thinking about a bank as an example, you have a vault where there's a single storage point where funds are being bridged to other assets and that single storage point is an attractive target for, for any hacker because at any point there's likely a significant amount of funds in that bridge. So if you look at all of these bridge hacks, you know, they're not $10 million, $5 million, they're, they're all upwards of $100 million. So they're a significant amount of value. Even if the hack is stopped quickly, there's still going to be a large number of assets sitting in that account. And it's one, you know, essentially one point that can be hit and you get a significant amount of value. Erin, this Nomad Bridge attack looked a little bit different from the others that we'd seen before earlier this year. Is it something we could see happen again? This one was different from other bridge hacks that occurred recently because it was a code exploit. So the Axie Infinity and Harmony hack were not due to vulnerabilities in the code. Those were age-old hacking of phishing, where somebody was able to retrieve a password to uh, somebody's system, and um, that password, they were then able to, to log in and gain access to private keys. So Axie Infinity released their report that it was due to somebody opening a malware-infected Word document. This is often the case that, that happens with phishing. and. Um, that occurred, not the exact same thing, and the analysis is not complete in Harmony, but the Harmony hack was also due to accessing the system through phishing, likely, you know, gaining access to private keys. The Nomad Bridge exploit was different, and that's why, we're, you know, you hear of it called an exploit as opposed to a hack, because it was code that was exploited. And when I say exploited, that means that there was a, a faulty aspect to the code that was identified. It was manipulated so that funds could be moved off the bridge. Was there a particularly unusual flaw uh, that was exploited on this occasion? What's also interesting about the Nomad exploit is because 
that code is open source and that vulnerability was identified and, and essentially pointed out when illicit funds were moved off, then there were a number of copycat exploiters who then noticed the code, spun up smart contracts very quickly, and were able to also move funds off of the bridge using, using that same exploit and um, leveraging that same vulnerability. I find it concerning just in the state of the, the world that people are, are that you know eager to, to steal other people's money when there's an opportunity. You don't see that where you know you can there's an old lady with cash you know hanging out of her bag and 300 people come running to steal it. Um, but as far as these these you know copycat the, the exploiters that jumped in, Many of them call themselves white hats and they did return, you know, the funds are being returned. Not all of the funds, but there have been, if you follow on Nomad's Twitter site, there have been a number of funds that have been returned. Rebuilding trust obviously has to be a key issue going forwards as well. What steps do you think uh, could, should be taken as far as that's concerned? For Bridges specifically, it's pointing out a need for more code to be to be looked at and validated before it's released. So these DeFi projects and DeFi you know, companies in general are quite small. So, you know, it's they're startups in general, they're startups in nature. We're not, you know, I work for, you know, a, a cryptocurrency company as well. Um, there's a big, a big pressure on, on these DeFi projects to have a significant amount of cybersecurity and a significant amount of software engineers to to be doing code audits so there is a need for the community to come together and look at code in a way that allows it to be audited and allows it to be protected from these vulnerabilities and DeFi companies in particular having external auditors verify the code validate the code make sure they're are no vulnerabilities. Both Axie and, and Harmony um, were quick to point to their um, their code auditors and their code auditing that was done, and they were audited, which is great. And that's exactly what we want to see, because if you can have a third party, party make sure that there are no um, vulnerabilities in the code before the code is launched, then that's going to go a long way to protecting the the code itself. Um, the the auditors also play a role in just knowing what what's occurring out there, what exploits are are possible, and just knowing the vulnerabilities across the space. So how is all of this impacting crypto prices? Those have already been under ridiculous pressure from all these macro worries we've had about inflation, energy prices, everything else. They've certainly seemed to have held up. One recent report actually shows the strongest crypto inflows this year coming in July. So let's talk to Annabelle Huang, managing partner of Amber Group, again about this. Annabelle, always great to chat to you and get your insights on uh, what's happening in the markets. What's your take on these hacks? What's your take on the impact that they've potentially been having on the market? Do you think they're putting investors on edge at all? Actually, I think we've seen markets have been recovering quite a bit since um, maybe the initial probably May and June um, news in, in the market. Of course, the price rally helps, I think, around the merge narrative and everything. So I think overall it was positive. Unfortunately, there, there have been a few hacks recently over, over just the last week, uh, especially around Solana, because there were quite a number of users affected. And I think the community and, and um, all the de developers really came together and investigated the issue. So I think initially we saw Solana uh, dip quite a bit, but now it has mostly recovered. Uh, and gained a bit of traction back. But I think that did expose some of the vulnerabilities around hot wallets and the key management there. And I think now that that topic is very top of mind. Um, in fact, uh, we recently launched our uh, custody business, including a mixture of cold, warm and hot wallets um, options and now we're getting a lot more inquiry around the cold uh, storage options uh, because of the recent events. Is macro news then still the big mover as far as crypto is concerned or are you seeing more evidence of uh, industry specific stories like the hacking uh, moving the needle for investors? The Coinbase deal, another one, um, this uh, uh, partnership with BlackRock to bring more institutional investors into crypto does look like something that would normally 
have ha an, a really big impact on prices, right? I think over the medium to, to longer term, it's still going to be very macro driven. We might have some intraday movements on the back of some of these positive or negative news coming out uh, in the market. The Coinbase news is, is definitely a big one in the institutional space. But in fact, we, we haven't seen, I would say, maybe compared to three, four years ago, news like this would definitely move the market quite a bit. But I think now, first of all, people are not survive, uh, surprised that crypto is going more mainstream or going more institutional. So that's a good sign. Uh, I think investors are a lot more sophisticated. They're looking at a lot more factors than just uh, the crypto the crypto ones. To your point, uh, it's still going to be very, very macro and sort of geopolitical driven. All right, so let's talk about the inflow of money into crypto in July. I mentioned that. What is that telling you? What is the story of uh, money in crypto right now as far as you're concerned? I would say uh, a lot of sort of uh, within the spot market, some of the buying flows we're seeing within the options market, people generally want to own some upside uh, from here, maybe some longer term upside opportunities from today, as well as the, the net AUM inflows that we've seen just on our own platform and I'm sure uh, on some other platforms as well, I think shows a sign that the general sentiment and confidence are coming back a bit in the market. But I would say still a lot of investors out there are being cautious, sitting on the sidelines, mostly in cash, um, which gives, I think, us a bit of runway when things do start to look uh, a, a bit better, especially from a macro perspective. All right, thanks again for that, Annabelle. That was Annabelle Huang from Amber Group. And that is it from us. Like and subscribe to this video for more content like it. Let us know your comments as well on what is happening down below.